Hello, everybody. Um, I thought I'd start with just introducing the panel speakers to start with, and then I'll give uh, a bit of a talk about Chettle and what it's all about. Uh, so today we've got Imogen Davenport, for, who's the Conservation Director at the Dorset Wildlife Trust. Next to her we have Amy Smith, who is uh, the Dorset Nature Recovery Strategy Head. Uh, we have um, Professor Rick Stafford, who's a marine biologist at Bournemouth University. And Julie Lee from Dorset Can, uh, who is heading up the great big Dorset hedge. So thank you to everybody for being here today, especially in the heat and making it this far, because I know there's definitely a few people fanning themselves now. Carry on. <laughs> um, I, uh, it, today is a difficult talk for me, I think. Chettle is... Um, many, it's multidisciplinary, it's many different things, and being asked to talk about nature recovery when you're standing up talking next to the Dorset Wildlife Trust, who've done a lot of nature recovery, and I'm just at the beginning of my journey, it was quite hard to work out uh, what to speak about and how. Um, so today's format, the, the, all of us will speak for five to ten minutes, um, which will be an overview of the work in nature recovery, and then there'll be some time for the audience to ask questions at the end. So I'll start with a little about me and my journey. I'm the owner of the Chettle Estate, which is essentially a whole village. I hate it when people ask me what I do as a job because it sounds like a bit of a knob saying I own a village. But I haven't quite worked out what else to say yet, so if anyone has any good ideas, let me know. Uh, under my stewardship is 850 acres of land, 36 dwellings rented at 60% of market value, renovated with as many recycled or eco products as possible, a thriving village shop with a huge range of eco, organic and local products, and a village population of roughly 100 people, 20% of whom are under the age of 18. So we have a very young village full of lots of young families. And I always try to choose people who move in who maybe earn less than others because they do a country trade or a country craft or are trying to keep alive some sort of tradition. I'm the third generation woman to own Chettle, which is extremely rare in large landowning circles. My grandmother inherited the estate, sorry, I'm just going to move this down a bit. My grandmother inherited the estate just after the war and had to concentrate on paying off large debts and keeping the big man house from falling down. My mother succeeded her in the late 70s and concentrated on rethatching properties and modernising the houses. I took over in late 2017, asked for my mother's death, with minus £50,000 in the bank and a number of compliance issues to fix. This was not long after I became really engaged in the climate crisis, uh, biodiversity breakdown and what the future might hold for humans and the plethora of organisms that, require us to, that we're required to depend on to keep life on Earth going. I think once you've had that... Uh, you know, the curtain opened, it's very hard to unsee what you have then seen, and it then, you know, I'm sure many of you in this room are in the same boat, if not all of us, is that once you realise what's going on, it's that kind of unhealthy consumerism of seeing, you know, wanting to know more and wanting to get through the brainwashing and the bullshit, but also it being a very quite, you know, quite scary journey, in fact, and I definitely think that I've suffered some eco-anxiety over the last six years, coupled with having to deal with the death of both of my parents and taking on a village with no money. So it's, uh, it's definitely been an interesting six years. Uh, it's a big jigsaw for just one person to try and manage, and I've had my fair share of difficulties navigate over the last six years. I found it hard, I found it hard to find people to advise me who share the same values as I do. I'm on my fifth land and farming agent, my third accountant, my third legal firm, and my third woodland advisor. Finding someone who is realistic yet practical takes some time, and they also have to be quite radical. Um, it's also very hard to implement change across all aspects of the estate with the income that I receive. Despite owning 850 acres, because of two tenant farmers on very long leases, one in perpetuity and one till 2034, I only have a say over what happens on 60 acres of the farmland. One tenant farmer has been farming the land since the 1960s. He's the one who has a tenancy on, in perpetuity. He farms 550 acres. He's not organic and farms mainly wheat, barley and grass seed. He doesn't live in the village and he never comes to any community events. 
The other tenant farmer is in organic conversion and has had 220 acres of farmland under his stewardship. He farms arable and sheep. He also doesn't live in the village, but he's much more engaged with the community and is always thinking about the birds and what there is available for them to eat. The challenge with him is that he is a staunch climate change denier and thinks that nature is doing just fine. <laughs> and the remaining 60 acres of land has been resting since the end of the intensive dairy that my mother left me with until they eventually went into liquidation in 2019 and I breathed a sigh of relief, apart from the fact that he left me with 750 dying cows and did a runner in the middle of the night. And that, was, that was part of my fun six years. Since then, the fields have been growing some rather large thistles, dock docks and sting nettles. Uh, the 60 acres will be home to three sets of farmers who will operate what is now called stacked enterprises. It's a bit of a buzzword in farming at the moment. I have a veg grower who has a master's in canning and preservation and will obviously become organic, and a chicken farmer who feeds her chickens local fermented oats, and she is a specialist in growing black soldier fly larvae. So the chickens will be completely closed loop because we ho in time we hope to be able to create our own land race of chickens, but that's quite, a, that's quite a hard one to do because there are very few chickens that know how to sit on an egg anymore. But at least we will start with their food being closed loop, which is virtually unheard of in chicken world in the UK. Uh, both of them are women and both of them are first generation farmers. Uh, and then I'm just waiting for a third agroecological farmer to come and graze the, the fields holistically, in tune with nature, so that a better balance of species can find their way into the grass sward. Watching the centre of the village and the 60 acres that surround the houses get wilder and more and more unkempt has been an interesting process. There's definitely been a noticeable increase in birds, especially goldfinches feeding on all of the, uh, the dock seeds, um, and owls. We've got, I think, maybe four or five barn owls that everybody sees regularly. The Tufty Fields has been great for small mammal population and there's an abundance of insects. And we've had amazing success with the trees and hedges that we've planted without the need for any maintenance due to the thick ground cover, collecting and retaining moisture and keeping them alive during the droughts. But what has been most interesting is how it has divided the community. Many feel uneasy with all that untidiness and mess. People have got very used to nature being manicured by hedge flailing, herbicides to control the weeds, constant cutting of the verges, animals overgrazing land to a neat green desert, and giant fields with no hedges or trees in, just acres of arable monocrops. The amount of social media posts I see from people writing hashtag nature on a post that shows a ginormous field of arable swaying gracefully in the breeze with a hedge about half a mile in the background and no biodiversity to be seen anywhere. Shifting baseline syndrome has meant that people now see a monocrop as being nature. I started to realise that not everybody in the community was on the same page as me. They saw the wildness as me letting the village go downhill. They wanted to see the verges cut and the standing deadwood chopped down and cleared up. And the thistles and nettles have definitely raised a lot of eyebrows. I tried talking to a lot of climate change denying residents, but I found I was faced with animosity and suspicion. I'd been to XR protests and other similar events, and it had been met with eye rolling or anger. And it struck me that I needed to tell a different story to the community, one that bound us together rather than divided us. And I realised that that story, to not be divisive and seen as a threat, needed to be based around nature. It's not like they could turn around and tell me that they hated nature. Chettle has always been hailed as having a great sense of community. But when I think about it, very little had been done as a community over the last two decades, aside from the occasional get-together for a jubilee or a royal wedding. So 2019 onwards was the beginning of the rewilding and rediscovery of the community of Chettle and the beginning of a wider audience that I now call the Friends of Chettle. Through a series of events held in 2020 to 2022 for villagers and Friends of Chettle, we now have got the buy-in from the majority of the locals. And it all started with an event called Hooray Day, where I invited the entire village to a day where we came together to... To, we came together to celebrate the last 40 years. We reminisced, we laughed, we ate local food, we drank local drinks, 
and I shared with everybody my vision for the next 40 years. We used the power of the invitation to inspire them to, to, inspire them to be part of the future of where they lived, worked and loved. As a group, we've now done the following over the last three to four years on the 60 acres of land. Collected seed, grown and planted 600 trees with the tree planting volunteers. Planted over one kilometre of new hedges with urban-based volunteers from St Ethelberger's multi-faith church in London. Started an annual apple day where we pick and juice over a thousand litres of apple and pear juice. Given the community free land to create an allotment where we have around a thousand metres squared of no dig beds now in their third year of production. In fact, last night, uh, 14 of us got together and uh, did some kind of maintenance in the allotment and then hosted dinner for 46 of us, including children, where we just picked produce straight from the garden and uh, yeah, made, I think, 14 salads. Um, and I, I offered that up as one of my, um, during a, a speech at Hooray Day and said to everybody, you know, if any of you want free space for growing veg, then, you know, that's what I think we all need to do. We need to champion local food. We need to get our kids to understand where your food is grown, why it's important that it comes from local producers and why we get back the power from the supermarkets and the, the, the large agricultural firms. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I also offer free land to anyone who wants to start a small-scale land-based business event or gathering. Uh, I've held over 10 foraging events for people to learn about free wild food around us and encourage the, the residents of the village that they have my permission to walk anywhere, especially if it's to gather food. I started an annual wassail where we've written new folk songs for the land and brought fun and purpose to a dreary January. We built a timber-framed communal wild kitchen for anyone to use, again, with local volunteers using local wood and scrap from the old dairy. I started an annual May Day with maypole dancing and homemade nettle beer. We've hosted night walks to look for glowworms, held women's circles once a month uh, in the woods when it's summer and in somebody's uh, house in the winter. Uh, we go out on group walks to listen to the dawn chorus or further afield to hear the nightingales and stock gaylard. And we also attended the April 2023 XR protests with 20 chattelers and six of those were children. I have even more examples, but you get the picture of the rewilding of the community. All of these actions, events and get-togethers have reconnected the community with the land, taught our children to respect and care for nature and help them understand that for humans to survive, nature needs to recover some of its wildness for it to also survive. I'd like to end with a reminder to us all. Humans are in a very tricky time right now where technology has accelerated so fast that it has cut us off from our connection to the natural world. I don't like to just talk about climate change. The thing that scares me even more is biodiversity loss, desertification, industrial farming, and the plethora of chemicals on our land, in the air, and in our water. It's meaning that we're heading for a very uncertain future. But we can't silo these problems and find individual solutions for them. An integrated approach needs to happen, and it needs to come from the top down and the bottom up. If we don't educate our children to care about nature, to understand how to grow food and then to cook it, to teach them proper skills to live a happy and fulfilling life without the need for all this pointless stuff that we buy and consume, then we will all be stuck in a constant battle pitting needs against consumerist wants. It's not possible to have infinite growth in a finite world. We do not have enough resources to be able to sustain the rate at which we consume, and our economic and financial systems are based on growth. The scale of the challenges we face are enormous, so for me, doing nothing is not an option. And I want to use my landowning privileges to help nature recover and spend my time trying to inspire other landowners to do the same. My call for action to everyone listening is to support local growers, join a veg box scheme and shop at local farm shops. Local food is absolutely key. Support your local volunteer groups who are striving to make change in local communities. Support nature, wild your garden, dig a pond and help pollinators. Support and talk to your children and grandchildren because they have a very tough time coming up. Thank you.
Thanks. Uh, next up is Imogen Davenport from uh, the Dorset Wildlife Trust. Thank you. And I do need to lower the microphone. <laughs> Thank you very much. And what an inspiring tale um, from Alice. And she's stolen my thunder on so many different things. She said, I don't think I've done very much to restore nature. I'm not sure what I can possibly say. And that, what a brilliant set of examples. So, um, good afternoon, um, and thank you for staying so long on such a hot day. Um, I'm Imogen Davenport, I'm Dorset Wildlife Trust Conservation Director, and I focus on something called nature-based solutions, which is all about integrating nature with other things that are equally um, or um, the same importance in life. I'm also Vice Chair of Dorset Local Nature Partnership, and some of you will have heard from Maria just recently uh, in a workshop about the Local Nature Partnership. Um, I've only got five minutes, so it's going to be a rattle through, uh, and I'm afraid I'm going to start with a few depressing statistics, but then move on to some hope. The UK is one of the most nature-depleted countries in the world, with one of the lowest amounts of wildlife left re remaining compared with pre-industrial times. Dorset hasn't escaped this, despite not having hugely heavy industry here. Over 400 land and freshwater species that have been recorded in the past are now thought to be extinct. That's about one in 40 of the species that have ever occurred in Dorset, gone. Extinction's only the tip of the iceberg though. Some 15% of all of Dorset species are threatened, rare, scarce, or protected for some reason. That includes over half our bee species, 42% of our butterflies. Sorry, I need it even lower. <laughs> the, reasons perhaps a little bit higher. the reasons behind the declines include development, pollution, persecution, and climate change. By far the biggest impact, however, is land use change. In Britain as a whole, and certainly in Dorset, 70% uh, of our land is, is in agriculture, so inevitably that has a disproportionate um, influence. And this isn't sort of deliberate um, on the part of sort of evil landowners. Um, between 1930 and 1980, government policy favoured this, favoured food and timber production and development ab ab above wildlife rather than with it. We were really good at it. We've got innovative um, people working out these problems, working out how to deliver government policy all the way through, and we can't blame them for um, doing that. We saw in that time a start change from a complicated landscape, small fields, mixed farming, woodlands, heathlands, water meadows, to that more sort of tidy, neat, bigger fields, conifer woodlands, straightened rivers, and urban creep. And in our marine environment, our rocky reefs, seagrass beds, and our harbours are particularly special. We have 157 marine species of conservation concern here. Um, but even here, fishing records show the crash in the health of the marine environment with huge declines in commercial fish catches and sizes, which just indicates the lack of health in the marine environment. And whilst these losses have slowed in that time, um, more sites were protected, people weren't sitting by watching this happen, people were campaigning. From the 1960s onward, we got some good legislation. It wasn't necessarily... A, um, fully implemented, but it has become more and more tight. Um, but however, the damage has been done. More radical action is needed um, to recover from such a low ebb. We can't do it just by protecting isolated areas. Wildlife is still declining overall. Meanwhile, we know that until COVID at least, people became more and more disconnected with nature. There were fewer opportunities out there to enjoy, manage, influence and care for our natural environment. Uh, and looking forward, climate change, um, having said it hasn't, it's played a part, but it hasn't been the main part in, in loss and decline of wildlife, these impacts will become more frequent, more disruptive and more damaging. So whenever we look at nature conservation, the climate crisis makes things worse. Uh, we cannot tackle a nature emergency without tackling a climate emergency, but equally a healthy environment is essential for our own health and well-being and our economic health as well. We can't tackle the a climate emergency without also tackling the nature emergency. So that's two things that need to go together and we worked very hard with our local authorities to make sure they were clear on that 
and bring them, um, having committed to climate um, strategies, bring them up uh, with the nature strategy playing an equal part in it as well. So where are we aiming for? Dorset Wildlife Trust wants to see 30% of land and sea managed for nature recovery by 2030. And despite this also being a government commitment, it's estimated only some 3.2% of England and 8% of land and 8% of the marine zone is currently well protected and managed for nature. In the case of Dorset, 52% is within area of outstanding natural beauty, so job done. Well, no. <laughs> um, much as our landscapes are valued, only 6.4% of Dorset's land owner is known to be in good condition, with nature thriving or recovering. But we do have some building blocks. In total, 13.6% of land has some form of recognition or protection for wildlife, and a further 86 is in with areas of high local wildlife value. So we've got about 22% in total. It's not beyond hope that management of all of that could be nature-friendly, plus another 8% of new areas enhanced by 2030. I'm being given the warning to, to wrap up now, <laughs> but I'm just going to give you a couple of examples just to, to give hope. We know that with intensive care, recovery is possible. For example, restoration work in Dorset has achieved um, recovery on very special habitats. We know that intensive care can work, but we need nature back everywhere through simple and widespread measures. And it's not, of course, not just on not Dorset Wildlife Trust land. We've got these trailblazing landowners like Alice making radical changes for people and nature. We've got farmers coming together in clusters all over Dorset to take collective action. So we all need to work together and it needs to be supported rather than hamstrung by national and local government policy. Um, that's why we're delighted to be working with Amy, our next speaker, to help our councils produce their local nature recovery strategy. Thank you. Hi everyone and thank you Imogen for the introduction. Um, I'm Amy, I, I'm employed by Dorset Council but I'm here to you today um, to introduce Dorset Local Nature Recovery Strategy. So, I don't know, Imogen said it's the theme of today, the challenges are serious, the scale of them is large but I, um, I don't know about anyone else but I am motivated by hearing what's already happening. So the Local Nature Recovery Strategy is one of 48 being developed across England. It is a requirement of the Environment Act, which means it will influence local decision making, local planning and action for nature, as well as helping deliver national environmental targets and a nature recovery network across the country. Um, so Dorset Council have been appointed as responsible authority, so we're leading the preparation of the strategy. We're working closely with Bournemouth Christchurch and Pool Council and Natural England, who are our supporting authorities. But importantly, it's not a council document. So although it will link with the work you heard earlier um, for, that both councils are doing on climate and environment, this strategy is for the people and county of Dorset, and it needs to be created collaboratively with a wide range of voices um, get having a say on the strategy. So Imogen's explained, you know, we, we know uh, why we need nature recovery in Dorset, and we know what's happening so far to try and achieve that. So we're not starting from scratch, and we can celebrate and learn from and build upon that existing work. Um, so as well as the things we've already heard about, um, the Dorset Environmental Record Centre and Dorset Local Nature Partnership have created ecological network maps. So we will be using those um, and building upon them. There have also been previous workshops in preparation um, for the strategy for further guidance to come from DEFRA. Um, and then there's so many local projects. My, I'm, I'm fairly new to the role. It's been my favourite thing about the role so far is learning how much is happening from large-scale landscape projects down to smaller community-level growing projects. Um, some of the other speakers here today have already told you about some, and we're going to hear some more. So the strategy will be a framework that brings all of that together and helps more of us work together to recover nature in Dorset. Um, we do have statutory guidance and regulations we need to follow, which in summary means that there are three main outputs we need to deliver. The first is a map of the most valuable existing areas for nature in the county. The second is for us to all agree priorities for nature's recovery in Dorset, the things that will have the most impact, and then map those as specific proposals on a map in places across Dorset where we, sit, where we agree we're going to prioritise for creating or improving areas for nature. And this 
means that the strategy will link with some of those wider changes that we've heard about that are happening in farming and land management, in planning and development, and in funding for nature. Um, and it also means that the, the strategy is about identifying the best opportunities for connecting, restoring and growing nature, but in doing so we will also be agreeing where that can help us tackle some other challenges like climate change, nature-based solutions to, for climate, but also for our water quality and flood protection, as well as our health and well-being. So creating this county-wide strategy that prioritises biodiversity but also kind of covers those wider issues is quite complicated. So we have set up a steering group and three expert advisory groups, and they include organisations with a range of expertise. So we have got representatives from the environment sector, but we've also got um, many people with experience of working in voluntary community sector organisations, working in health, working um, in the youth sector. And then that's just the beginning. We will then be inviting organisations and people, and hopefully lots of you here today, to contribute to the strategy. At the moment, I can't say when that will be yet, but that's just because we're just getting started, we're just making our plans, and then we will share an update um, as soon as we can. In the meantime, though, I am, like I said, I'm loving hearing from anyone that's delivering a nature recovery project or has ideas about how their work might contribute to the strategy. So please do get in touch. You can find the um, latest updates and contact details if you go on the Dorset Council website, Local Nature Recovery Strategy, but I'm sure it'll be in the post-event um, things from today. But for now, I'll just say thank you so much. I hope that you'll be excited to get involved in this. I know I'm looking forward to working with all of you. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening. Thanks, Amy. And next, uh, Rick, the marine biologist. Um, I might move this up a bit. I think so. That sounds about yeah. Um, it's nice to see everyone actually taking notes. It's like it, I won't see this in two weeks' time when university starts again because nobody sits here with pens and paper anymore. Um, but. I work at Bournemouth University, I'm predominantly a marine biologist, but I want to also talk about some of the work I do with the British Ecological Society, and we've produced three reports in recent years, or two reports, and one about to come out. So one on nature-based solutions, one on the 30 by 30 drive for protected areas, and currently one on regenerative agriculture as well, and I think that fits in quite nicely. I'll also sort of, at the end of this talk, go into some sort of nature recovery ideas and how I can see it working in the marine environment as well. But we really face three, at a global scale, we face three environmental issues. Um, climate change, biodiversity loss, but also the amount of uh, nutrients going into the environment, phosphates and nitrates and things like that. And these, of course, are synergistic. So climate affects biodiversity loss. Biodiversity loss will affect climate and so on. So they can't be thought of in isolation. The other thing, there was a report today um, I saw on the news, but it's, it's pretty obvious. We are not going to meet our 1.5 degree climate targets. Um, current estimate is 2.4. Um, so we, we, we're not going to meet it. We have to be honest about that. Does, that doesn't mean we need to stop doing things because more climate change is worse than less climate change, always. Um, but we are going to suffer some of the consequences of that. And, you know, we, we can see it now if we just watch the news. But the effects on nature are going to be big. The effects on nature in Dorset are also going to be quite big. And nature restoration is important because it creates biodiverse ecosystems. Those ecosystems are more resilient. They are better able to cope with change. And that change could be climate change. That change could be extra nutrients coming in. So we need to have nature recovery now to create these systems which aren't going to collapse in the future. They need to be strong and resilient right now. The other thing which is going to happen alongside climate change, and is going to be particularly, probably one of the major effects actually of climate change in Dorset, is the amount of migration that's going to happen. We're quite privileged living here. It's hot today, but it's going to be very hot in other parts of the world, and it's going to be uninhabitable. So that means we need to make room for people, and we need food to feed people. So what we can't do is put just, just give up everything for nature. We have to work 
with nature, but also be able to grow food and things like that. You know, there's, there's a debate in ecology called nature sparing versus nature sharing. There's some great examples, and I'll give, you know, it's not to say we shouldn't have protected areas, but actually our protected areas are pretty poorly managed and pretty ineffective in most cases, both on land and in the sea. I think we do need to change this nature sharing thing. It doesn't say we don't have some great projects like the rewilding project at Wild Woodbury or something like that. Brilliant to have those as well, but we need to think of our land, we need to think of agricultural land in terms of how good it is for nature because that, that agriculture needs to be sustainable as well. So, I want to talk a little bit about the marine environment and how we think about the marine environment and how we could restore nature in the marine environment. So, natural restoration, things like replanting seagrass beds, can be a great idea. A lot of the time, because of the way that um, reproduction happens in the sea and we have planktonic dispersal of most species, if we leave things alone, they get better. Okay, they recover. That's generally what happens in the sea. It isn't always what happens on land. So things like the network of highly protected marine areas which have been proposed are a good thing. They're not always in the right place. They haven't necessarily been well thought out in terms of the community, but they're a good idea in general. But we need to think beyond that. We need to think about multiple uses of the sea and how to make the most of multiple uses of the sea. So to give you an example, in Lyme Regis, there is an offshore mussel farm. Uh, loads of ropes, grow mussels on those ropes, and it's a completely win-win situation. So we're growing food. Uh, mussels have the lowest carbon footprint of any food beyond, beyond anything like a vegan diet. Um, don't eat them too much, they've got too much lead in them. But if you do eat them sometimes, it's absolutely fine. Um, so we're providing food. We're adding complexity to the ocean. We're adding this structural complexity which we would get from things like offshore reefs. It's increasing biodiversity. It's potentially even increasing the carbon sequestration of the, um, of the environment. We've got potential for things like artificial reefs, something I've done a, a fair bit of work on, um, to restore and actually enhance environments. Um, there's really good potential to be using these as co-location activities as well. So we need offshore wind. We know we need offshore wind. We can put artificial reefs where those offshore wind farms are and we can enhance biodiversity. I will stop very soon. Uh, we can enhance biodiversity in those sites. Um, we can also put things like uh, seaweed aquaculture there, which again can create local industry. It can uh, also sequester quite a bit of carbon. Kelp grows about three times faster than uh, trees do, for example and captures about three times as much carbon. So we need to think about these multiple uses for the sea, but the real problem in actually doing this is regulation. If we want to put aquaculture at an offshore wind farm, there are eight different government agencies that need to grant approval, and it should be a win-win situation. So we do need different ways of thinking about things, and perhaps that's the main message I'd like to get across now. Thank you. Hi everybody. Um, yes, so I'm going to just talk a little bit and then whiz through the slides. Um, so the Great Big Dorset Hedge is, as you probably know by now, is one of the main big projects for Dorset Climate Action Network. And um, it came about as part of land use team um, meetings about uh, what would, it would be nice to have a project and um, a sort of an engagement project, volunteer engagement project, and it's what do we focus on, so lots of different conversations, and hedgerows seem to be a, a solution, uh, timing with the various campaigns from the CPRE, the PTES, and government incentives that we were hoping to come through, which have, of course, come through now. So hedgerows are a very uh, non-contentious within reason, uh, 
part of the landscape. They, they wrap around the landscape. They join urban and rural areas, potentially, and they connect fragmented ecosystems. And they provide enormous ecological and wildlife benefits for really what is quite a compact, efficient space. So we're looking at all sorts of carbon sequestration, flood management, um, wildlife corridors, wildlife habitats for such an enormous variety of wildlife as well. So uh, they are, and they are an attractive asset as well, so they fit within the AOMB landscape. Uh, within uh, urban areas, uh, hedgerows, well, our gardens are the most in really, really important potential uh, space for biodiversity. Our gardens in the UK are as, as much as our national parks, if you put them all together. So they're a very important potential source of biodiversity, and so they are important to link across the landscape. So this Great Big Dorset Hedgerow project is not just a, a, a rural project, it's an urban project as well. It's an education project, hoping to get people to understand how they can help protect nature and they can get involved really at any, any level and any part of the project they would like. So um, it's taken about two years to design and uh, to get going on. And just a few facts about hedgerows. Um, George Eustace, the minister for involved in the, L, the um, environmental land management stewardship programs, developing them, Minister George Eustace said they are probably the most important ecological building blocks of our landscape. And the aim of our project is that we will facilitate the enhancement of existing hedgerows in the landscape and stimulate the planting of, of uh, hedgerow so that we are trying to aim for the 40% increase targeted by the Glasgow Climate Change Committee. Most farmers see them as a very important part of their landscape. Uh, how they manage them will depend upon how they fit within the landscape, what their time available is, what they are aiming for, for the, their role of the hedgerow within their landscape. Um, I have a quote here from one of the farmers that we've been involved with, Tim Harris from Powerstock, and he says that farmers are the custodians of the hedgerows in the landscape. And we have found with our engagement with farmers that is very much a, a, a feeling, a feeling of care and a feeling of wanting to have the time to be involved in managing them. Um, there is a video playing out in the foyer that shows uh, a few little snippets of information for uh, volunteers that have been involved in the programme, having a, a, a voicing their opinion about their involvement. And uh, we have a lot of information on our website, and we've got various cards out in there and in the foyer that you can pick up, and uh, there's a QR code so you can go straight to the website. So it's a volunteer engagement project. We have a lot of volunteers signed up. Um, and the volunteers are really enjoying being involved in the project. And at this stage, we're surveying. So in order to know how you're going to restore a hedgerow, you've got to survey it and know what you've got. So we were looking at hedgerow structure, looking at species, looking at metrics such as depth, height, and where that hedgerow is within its own landscape. Uh, so just very briefly, because I could go on about this forever, so I will try and be good. Stick to my five minutes. Um, so, what am I looking? Oh, there we go. Uh, I've got to speak to the mic and remember what the slide does. So, uh, so as it says, we want to facilitate the restoration of hedgerows. We've been, been. Oh, this is very difficult actually. <laughs> We've been, I can't see anything. That's the trouble. Um, so, because I can't see that far. Um, so we've surveyed so far about 800 kilometres of hedgerow. As Giles said this morning, we've done 800 kilometres, but we haven't done, <laughs> we've surveyed, <laughs> we haven't planted. Um, and it's all very much by conversation and invitation by farmers. They are very interested in how the surveying will link into the new sustainable farming incentives which is survey-based, so a farmer needs to actually look at their hedgerows. Most farmers don't have the time for that. And so if you invite a team of, of nicely trained people to carefully walk around your land and save you maybe 10 hours of time of looking at your hedgerows, this is, of course, of benefit to everybody involved. So we want to, take, to help take the um, sustainable farming incentives a leap forwards. And... This is just a brief summary of how the 
how the incentive will help incentivize the farmer um, and to the kind of amounts of money that they can get to help with their planting and restoration projects. As, as a farm owner, I know that these incentives are useful. They certainly don't cover all your costs, but they make the difference between thinking, I can't manage this, I can't do it, I can't afford it, and thinking, actually, this is a step towards my costs and it's something I want to do. So it's certainly not a profit-generating exercise, but it is so valuable in, in promoting the nature recovery and uh, getting those hedgerows in place or restored. Um, so in many cases, this might just be funding towards hedge laying, and that might be by expert contractors, or many of the contractors are keen to train up volunteers because they love their, their, their art and they want to promote it. This is just to, to show you the, the level of uh, technicality we're involved in. We're using the People's Trust for Endangered Species hedgerow metric system designed by Nigel Adams. And this is now being um, suggested by DEFRA as the method to follow for hedgerow uh, uh, surveying. So it means we're tying in with them, with our project, because we've, we've kind of influenced them. Our project manager, John Calder, is um, heavily involved with pushing DEFRA in the right direction. This is the kind of data that we've been generating. So in the, in the background, you can see some people looking at hedgerows. Um, and then we're looking at de depth, width, we're looking at different species. So we, uh, uh, obviously, at different times of the year, it can be difficult to um, identify different species. You start looking at twigs at certain times of year and getting your eye in for different types of bark. And, uh, but you're, 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 on the whole, it's quite straightforward to learn to identify different species. And most people really enjoy learning those new skills or enhancing those skills if they've got them. We do small groups of surveying. It's usually three or four people at the most. Otherwise, you just end up chatting and not surveying. Or at least that's what happens with my surveys. Um, and then you can see from the uh, bar chart that that links into, uh, if you remember the Adams code on the slide before, you can see that each, uh, you've, got, you've got the different uh, proportions of hedgerow that have come up in the different quality. A farmer, a landowner, or a parish council will be able to look at that and, and think, right, I can focus on hedge 635B, and that's where I need to do some hedge laying. So it's all very carefully mapped, and it's, it saves time, it's efficient in a good way, and um, it, uh, you know, it's, uh, we're getting some really nice results with our farm surveys and some very good uh, indications of what work needs to be done. This is just an example slide of how we develop the volunteer role. So some people, um, we have majority of people just want to come on surveys and just be involved in that side. And then we have others who might want to be a coordinator. There are mapping techniques to be done. There's data input to be done. So as you can imagine, the, the mapping and the data input are where we're slightly struggling to get uh, coordinators and volunteers. So anybody out there loves doing GIS mapping or wants to do that side of the project, we'd be very, we'd be very willing to take you on. Um, we are looking. We've, we have already partnered with CPRE and the AOMB. We've had a grant from the AOMB last year, CPRE grant, and um, so they're very supportive for uh, to us. And we're looking also at partnering with um, Dorset Council uh, in terms of their farm clusters, but also in terms of their, their helping us with running the project side. Environment Agency are very interested in it. Um, so there's a lot of realisation that a project of this scale is actually managing to engage with people, which of course is very difficult for government bodies to do. Whereas because we can have that volunteer engagement, it, it seems to be working as becoming quite an important project. Um, and that's an example of the kind of maps we generate from the results, all the, all the different colours. Uh, it's all colour coded. It's all amazingly put in by one, one ecologist, John Blanchard, is helping us. 
as well as various other <laughs> similar projects. So uh, uh, some incredible amount of data input going into that. I think we've just, we've just um, surveyed Alice's lovely estate as well. And the conclusion is beautiful hedgerows, <laughs> beautiful hedgerows and some deer damage, of course. Um, and Oh, that's it. That's it from me. So just, I'll just read one last statement from John Calder. Um, so we've had 90, uh, we were wrong about the 800 kilometres, 250 kilometres of hedgerow surveyed so far in 12 months. Active partition of 90 volunteers, mostly in West Dorset. And I have to say the small field structure and the really amazing hedgerows of West Dorset have driven the work to be so far mostly in West Dorset. Um, and so we just need to extend that into all the other areas of Dorset. And thank you very much. I just want to say a quick thank you to all the speakers, uh, Dorset Wildlife Trust. Uh, I'm you know, big fan of Wild Woodbury and what you're doing there. Um, and the Local Nature Recovery Partnership, as I said to you, Amy, before, you know, it's something that I, I know other farmers that are involved in it, and I'm really excited by what's coming next. Uh, Rick, thank you for uh, that. It was brilliant. I love eating mussels, but I'm quite sad that they're full of lead. <laughs> <laughs> and Julie, yes, it was brilliant. Thank you for you guys coming to uh, survey my hedgerows. And I did know about SFI, but I didn't know the numbers of what I get, so very happy. Um, I just wanted to say that we've probably got about 10 minutes for, for questions. So if anybody's got questions, one there, one there. Oh, God, a lot of you. <laughs> uh, who's got the roving mic? Oh, there. Uh, this lady down there in the blue to start with. <coughs> I wanted to ask um, our, last, our last speaker, uh, how do you manage a garden that grows? We have a hay planted between our house and the allotments next door, and we were given some little plants by the, um, the Woodland Trust, and, uh, and we put them in, but of course they're now about 15 feet high, and we can't reach them to trim them properly. Should we have had the hay laid? Should I be trying to hay lay? Or is that the best way to let them grow up and then just cut them at the top? Um, I suppose the, the initial best way would be, um, as a, I'm a gardener as well, um, if I was going to plant a new hedge and it was a, well, even, even a rural hedge, you've actually got to just keep cutting at them to get that density. But if, if you've left it to grow at all, you could lay it, depends what your species are. Um, you could underplant to get some thickness in. Uh, from a wildlife point of view, I think you're always, if you think of the surface area of the hedge, uh, the bigger the surface area, so the denser, the more of it, the more surface you've got for, for insect biodiversity. But yeah, you could probably lay that depending on what your species are, um, or just cut it, <laughs> start, cut it low and um, cut into it, and then you get thickness. Depends what your species are in your hedge. One slight complication: my husband keeps planting brassicas in the months. Oh well. <laughs> 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 um, I'm not a huge Chris Olivia fan. <laughs> Great. Who, was, who else had questions? Uh, man in the orange down there. Um, this is to do with um, strategy. Uh, I come from the other end of the, of the county, up by Cranham. And um, the Martin Down Farmers Cluster is right up there. And I was wondering if you were following that, as it, I think it's the first in the country. It seems like a really good way of leveraging landowners and, and conservation. I was, are you, are you, do you think that's something that you want to... Echo? Yes, I agree with you. A great example, one of the great examples, um, like I said, that we'd be building on in that, that, that farm cluster amongst many others in the county. Um, I, don't, I, I can't say that I've directly spoken to all of them yet, because I haven't, but we will be um, using that farm cluster network as, a, as, like you say, as a way to learn from what's already happening and then to help us prioritise what, what might happen in the future. Great. Any next question? Uh, this man in the check shirt. Uh, yes, thank you. Julie, you both mentioned incentives and for farmers to change as usual that money. The June issue of the SFI we put a picture of, is that making it 
difference. At the local farmer that may have made a difference, he would be proud to be put in uh, a grass which has now got 10 species of crowd and he's generated that species of income. Is that enough? I mean, I'm, I wouldn't call myself a farmer at the moment. Um, it's a foray that I kind of dip my toe in and out of. Um, I, I definitely say that it's, uh, the incentives could be much larger. Having done quite a lot of uh, planting with the Forestry Commission, uh, Woodland Trust, um, a FWAG scheme, a Farming Wildlife Advisory Group, their, their scheme closed the gap, which was for planting more hedges. And I've now I've done a spreadsheet which shows what I got in from grants and what I paid out. And they tell you that the grants are 100%, and I would say that they probably cover 30%. Uh, but that is also because I refuse to spray glyphosate on the things first and I mulch all of my trees and, and that costs a lot of money. So if I did it to the book and just really didn't care and shoved loads of trees in the ground and let them do their own thing, then it might be different. Um, but I definitely think it's helpful. I mean, I was doing the hedgerows anyway, so now to know that there's a grant which can pay for some of that, I mean, it's fantastic. I think things are going in the right direction from a subsidy point of view. But if you think that uh, farming, what is it, only gets three billion pounds a year in subsidies, and you compare that to the fossil fuel industry, and actually, as we've heard many times over today, the farming industry is one of the largest emitters. You know, it's the farming and food industry, it's what I spend a lot of my time talking about because of my village shop and because I understand all of the different parts of from farm to to selling. Um, so yeah, I just think three billion is a bit of a joke when it could be one of our biggest drivers for change. Any other questions? That uh, lady up there in the green. Thank you. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about land use and farming and growing more food, but the two elephants in the room haven't been mentioned, namely sheep and cow. Do you want me to field that one? <laughs> I, I don't mind talking about that, but also you... <laughs> um, I mean, I agree. I probably eat meat about once a month, and I try for that only to be venison. Um, I don't think that the pushing of, uh, you know, highly processed food, whether it's vegan, vegetarian, or you know, you know, non-vegan, is 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 the thing. I think we do need to address. You know, what, what's the, there's that massive percentage of land that we use just to grow food for animals. I mean, it's absolutely insane. Huh? I agree, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, yeah, when on my 60 acres of land, I think I will hope to have a maximum of 12 cows, and that's just so that they can, you know, keep things down. I mean, it, it's a very controversial subject. There's a lot of people that like to eat meat, but I just think that we could do so much more if, you know, advertising was changed and kids were taught in schools from a very early age what a healthy diet was, and it doesn't need to be meat twice a day. Thank you. Do you want to add to that? Thanks. And, um, just, well, just to add to that, and it, it's a complicated story, and as, as most of you all know, because you're well informed, it's a lot of it is about how things are produced and um, the overall figures are complicated by imports um, of feed, etc. So in terms of nature conservation, we do need um, grazing for a lot of our habitats to be maintained. However, um, what we don't have is any um, meaningful data, certainly from the UK, about how that actually impacts carbon emissions. So that's something we've been trying to struggle with in the Wildlife Trust, of taking figures that were developed from, for intensive um, intensive farm systems and applying it to nature conservation grazing. We're just not there. More, more research is needed, as uh, the university colleague will be pleased to hear. Um, but no doubt we do need to change our diet, we do need to change our attitude to, to food, and it's, it's, it's incredibly complicated and inter, inter, interwoven, which is why um, it's been in the too, too hard to deal with box for some time, but we need to get it out of that box. Yeah. I feel like we need a less polarised conversation about it, that you either have to be vegan or a meat eater, because I just don't think that helps. Um, yeah, uh, I think we've got... Oh, sorry, Rick, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I basically agree with what's been said. I mean, you, there, there are carbon advantages, there are biodiversity advantages of grazing animals in some places. 
We also have farmland which isn't suitable for growing crops uh, where, you know, actually sheep farming and things like that can work. So we shouldn't necessarily think we can't have these animals, but we eat far too much meat and we need to massively cut down and that's, that's kind of the main, uh, the main thing. Equally, just very quickly on the subsidies, one of the things that we found is they're not long enough really for nature recovery, a lot of the subsidies. You know, they're five, ten years, they need to be 30 years if they're going to really make a difference. Yeah, I had a, I applied for some FIPL funding through the AOMB uh, for some roundels, which is like a new concept from the Woodland Trust. And you plant uh, 40 trees in something quite dense and then put one roll of 50 metre fencing around it. And then after, depending on what trees you plant, after maybe eight to ten years, you can take the fencing off and then you have a living barn for your livestock so that they can spend as much time outside as possible. And uh, the AOMB panel said that that was too long a project and too radical for them to fund. I was like, I'm planting trees in a circle. It's not that difficult. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, we've got time for one more question. So maybe somebody from, well, actually, no. Stick a hand up, anybody. Man at the front. Do you want to shout or do you want, oh no, microphone's coming, microphone's coming. Thank you for everyone. Um, you talked about, you talk about multiple use, and I just wonder what you see as the key, the key drivers for, to deliver multiple use, rural land use, uh, green use. Um, yeah, so, so um, things like multiple use of offshore wind. So obviously we need offshore wind, it's going to be it's going to be happening, hopefully. It's going to be happening in an accelerating way. But we also have to put down scour protection. So it's a question of how you can sort of maximise maximize that. So we can maximise a lot of biodiversity with things like artificial reefs. But actually, there are so many benefits to doing the right, the right thing with wind farms. Obviously, we're reducing, uh, we're creating more renewable energy. I was going to say we're reducing fossil fuels. They don't necessarily go together, but we're definitely creating more renewable energy. Uh, we can enhance biodiversity, but if we do things like seaweed aquaculture as well, then we actually can have an industry. Um, you know, the most deprived, or lots of the most deprived towns in the UK are former fishing villages, and they haven't got that fishing industry anymore. But they probably have a lot of that infrastructure of you know, potential people to go out in boats, harvest that seaweed, process that seaweed into different products. And again, that seaweed itself can... So you've got levelling up benefits, you've got carbon sequestration benefits of that seaweed. There's so many different drivers it fits in that it really should be a government priority. But instead, there's just multiple hindrances on doing it to the extent that even the renewable energy companies who are interested in it give up because it's too difficult. Right, well... Oh, have I got time for one more? No, done. Uh, thank you so much to all of our speakers um, and uh, a really great thing to end on, Rick. I definitely agree, seaweed farming. I mean, nutrient dense and would just solve many crises in fishing villages. Uh, thanks to everyone for listening and um, yeah, over to Jenny. Thank you, Alice and the panel, for such brilliant speeches, talks. Um, very interesting, informative, and the fact that the audience has been so engaged shows what a, a topic this is. We could have um, a whole day just on this subject.